Um, okay, so we're going to continue talking about variational problems. And um, see how much we can do. But <clears throat> so let me remind you really quick um, what the setup is. So the setup is to minimize a functional. That's a that's a function of functions, if you like, which. Um, also has to specify that what is the set of admissible paths or functions. Okay, and let me be, let me be very clear here. We're going to consider that this is a function of one variable, x, in some interval. So that would be, I don't know, one-dimensional uh, independent variable. So for that reason, we think of this uh, U as paths. Now, we'll, we'll talk also today about, so yesterday we talked about functions that take only real values. So you can just plot them. Um, so for instance, U is scalar. So then you, you really can do You can visualize U as being some sort of path in the plane, right? But we'll, we'll see also that U can be <clears throat> n-dimensional. So it's still a function of, of x, which we're going to restrict it to be uh, one-dimensional. So x is still an interval. But in that case, this is going to be thought as a path in. It's also a path, right? It's a, it's a uh, path from a point in Rn. I don't know. Let's think of it like this. So it's, this is, say, R2. Then it's going to be you know, a point here and to a point there. But this is A, and this would be B, right? So it's really a path in Rn plus 1. Okay? And it would still have prescribed, well, you can have prescribed both endpoints, one endpoint, no endpoint, you know, you can have other restrictions as we'll see in a, in a, in a second. Okay? So, uh, and how do the functional look like? So the functional to be minimized looks <clears throat> like an integral with respect to x over this interval and it has some uh, integrant that may depend on x, may depend on u of x, may depend on u prime of x. Okay. Okay. Later on, you can actually include second derivative of u and so forth. But if you think of u as being sort of a real trajectory in R n. Maybe I should put the Rn here instead of R2. Then, uh, then this is probably one of the most physical, uh, relevant situation where the integrand may depend on. This would be the time. Uh, so it may depend on time explicitly. It may depend on the location of that path, right? It may depend on the speed of that path. Right. So, in the case, <clears throat> I mean, 
really this uh, this formula is true for 1D as well as for paths in you know uh, U has uh, may have uh, several variables. So for instance, if U is a scalar function then you know that's what it looks like uh, or you may be um, a function well maybe maybe let's let's just do it like this so if n is greater than 1 and u is a f function defined on interval a b but with values in rn so u would be u1, u2, un, then this really would mean could be a function of x of u1, un, and u1 prime, un prime. Okay? So that's what you could could you, what you could have, okay? So you can, we're gonna always write the function like this, but we may think of u as being vector or scalar, okay? Now, the next step would be to think of x as being uh, several variables, not just on an interval. And that's where the book has that uh, sort of gradient, because then you don't have the derivative, you have the gradient with respect to x, right? And the Euler-Lagrange equation would have to be modified uh, um, accordingly, but if x is one variable, the Euler-Lagrange equations look as follows. And I'm going to write it in the following in the following form. Um, I'm going to instead of introducing lambda and, and xi, which which they have a reason to be there, but let me write it like the following way so, to see how it's easy it is to kind of expand to uh, n dimensions. So this would be the f partial derivative of f with respect to the second variable, right? minus derivative with respect to x. x is one dimensional, so it's just plain derivative of f sub partial with respect to third, third variable. Okay? And of course, these things are evaluated at the, the, the specific um, Uh, argument x u and u prime right okay now what happens if it's n dimensional so this is so if uh, if u is just scalar then one we have one equation, right? But if u is is a, a vector in R n, then the Euler Lagrange equations are is not an equation, but it's a system of equations. N equations. And right, just look at this. You know, f would be would have several um, arguments, right? So the Euler-Lagrange equation would translate in the following: would be f sub u i minus derivative with respect to x f sub u i prime equals zero for i equals one through n.
Okay, and why is that? Well, you could kind of imagine how we derive this when u was just a scalar. We said that corresponds to the derivative in the direction of a function uh, phi and that was a scalar. In the case you have a vector, you would have to consider u plus t phi, where phi has n components. When you redo that, basically replace you know, u with u plus t phi, and you take the derivative with respect to t, set it equal to zero, I mean, set t equal to zero, this is what will come out. You'll have a system of equations, okay? In physics, this is kind of used a lot. Um, many times you, I mean, x is really t, because that's time. Um, the position is usually called x, xi, and the derivative of the position would be the velocity or the momentum, and they're used, they're called pi. Okay, just in case you've seen that in physics. So, in physics, um, so x is like this. Uh, and of course, x can be x1 through xn. And uh, one uses f of, um, excuse me, not, not pi was, is, is still xi prime, xi dot. They use xi dot there. Say this is zero. Okay. So let's see. What we're going to do now is um, kind of see some of the some specific cases when this uh, variational problem is relevant. So, and I'm going to start with a physical application. Um, that is basically motion uh, according to Newton's law of motion. And mass times acceleration is the force applied. Okay. And um, so the first application is in. Um, Newton's law of motion. And a conservative field. Okay, so what is that? You know, you well, uh, you very well know that if you have a force applied to an object, of mass m, then that object will actually have an acceleration, m times a equals a force, right? And the acceleration is, uh, is the derivative of the velocity vector, right? And the velocity is the derivative of the position vector. So just mess mess this up here. So so I'm gonna sort of for a while talk about x being the position and t being the time, right? This is the velocity. This is the acceleration. Okay, and <clears throat> what does it mean that the force 
f, uh, f the force field. So we have we have basically a force that acts at every location in the the space where the motion takes place. F we say that f is conservative if f is the gradient or you know. Uh, there's a reason why we put minus gradient of a so-called potential function. Does anybody remember from a calculus three? Why is this called conservative? Why is the gradient vector field? Right? So if I have a potential function, u is a function of x. So u is a function of x, right? Think of an R3. And I consider this gradient. You know, opposite or not, uh, doesn't matter. Why is this called conservative vector field? The work is path independent. The work is path independent. So the line integrals um, of, of this force, basically the work done by this force along any path is independent of the path, is only dependent of the endpoints of the path. Another way to say this is if I take closed loop, the work is zero. So basically, wherever the work was positive, you know, there's compensation. So in the end, the total work over closed loops is zero. And that basically says, corresponds to conservative vector field. And an example that, you know, you have to think in mind is the, the um, gravitational force. So for instance, Gravitational force is well. Think of it as uh, I'm sorry, G. Yeah, it's a constant. Um, J, if you want. Okay, so if I have, or K, if in R, th in R3. Yeah, let's think about it in R3. Uh, R3 or R2 is the same. Let me just stick with R2 for now. So I and J, J is a vertical direction, and the force, the force is actually negative. MJ. That's the the acceleration is constant, right? So the force would be minus MG. So what it, why is this uh, conservative? Because G, um, you can write U of X to be minus MG X2, I guess, right? If you take the gradient of this, the first component is zero, the second component is minus mg. So it's exactly that. Um, I mean, there, the, pot the potential is not unique. You can actually add a constant and have uh, the same uh, uh, relationship. But this is this is one one of them, for instance. Okay, so. Uh, so the question that we have is how can we describe the motion, you know, starting with this um, Newton's law of motion in a in a in a gradient or in a in a conservative vector field. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Right. So basically, it says that the potential is is increasing as you go up. And it decreases as you go down. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, the claim is the following is that MA equals F equals this particular F that's conservative. So that is my opposite to gradient of a potential function is the Euler-Lagrange 
equation or system for the um, functional and uh, we use L actually uh, here it, does, it doesn't matter it's just the functional I given by the following so it's the following function of X and uh, x dot, x prime, well, dt. Where L has this specific form is, let's see, m length of x prime squared over 2. Now this in physics is called the kinetic energy. Okay. Minus U of X. Okay. So if if you uh, construct this function, you know, and, and again, it may it may sound like uh, you know it's just artificial, but think about. You have on each path, you know, you you assign this this scalar number, right? So take a path in in R n, right? Take the derivative, length of derivative squared, like this, right? This will depend on on t where it's evaluated, but we integrate with respect to t, and that we call it to be the functional. Okay. This is called the Lagrangian. And I think I think it's the integrand that's called the Lagrangian, isn't it? Functional. I'm sorry, the Lagrangian of the along the path x equals x of t. So basically, this will be sort of a function of t that's along the Lagrangian. Um, the corresponding, it's on page 152, but it's a little bit different as far as notation. So if you look at 152, you'll see the size and the lambdas. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't really um, say you should follow that because you might get confused. So just just think of that, you know, of this expression you integrate and the fact that the uh, Newton's law of motion is saying well, as we'll, as we'll see, it's actually the euler grange equation for this um, for this uh, functional might say that if you want to minimize this integral then the minimum is going to achieve Basically, where the motion is going to take place. I mean, the motion is going to take place uh, at an at a optimal path for this, for this, uh, for minimizing this functional. It will be sort of called the uh, uh, principle of least action. You want to have, so this would be sort of the action along that path, right? Say you have you fix two points, and you say, I want to go from this point to that point, and have the least action. Action meaning that functional, right? Well, the optimal path will be a potential minimizer, right? So if somehow you, you say there is a unique minimizer, well, that's going to be the motion that's going to take place. I mean, m m a equals force, okay? So why is this why is this claim so so if you start with this functional how do you actually get the Euler Lagrange system or equations well take the partial of 
<coughs> of this integrand with respect to x, each x, right? So the Euler Lagrange says this, right? Well, what's the derivative of L with respect to, say, x1, the first component of x? x1 doesn't appear here, right? In the first. It only appears in the second one, right? So this basically says, so let me write it, Lxi is a partial of L with respect to xi, and this is minus partial of u with respect to xi. Yeah? Again, L is given by this, by that formula, right? So the partial with respect to the first n components is only hitting on the second one, right? Because the first one doesn't has xi in it, it has xi prime, okay? Those are totally independent variables. And L xi prime, that also will have to be differentiated with respect to t. But before differentiating, what's the derivative with, say, x1 prime? Well, there's no x1 prime in the second equation, in the second part of the, of the Lagrangian, right? In the potential. But it is in the first part, and how do we differentiate that? Well, the length square is basically the sum of the squares of x1 prime, x2 prime, x1 prime. So this is going to be just m xi prime. Right? There's a 2 that gets simplified with the 2 in the bottom. So what's the Lagrange's... Uh, um, the Euler-Lagrange equation? It's going to be minus partial of u with respect to xi minus u with respect to t of mxi prime equals zero. And remember now, these things, so once you do this kind of formal differentiation, now you have to go back to evaluate it at, along the path. So now x, xi prime becomes xi prime of t, and so it basically is the second derivative of that. So you see mass times acceleration is the force because force is, is the gradient of, of u, minus gradient of u, okay? So again, basically Newton's law is just, can be rephrased in saying that from going to point A to point B in a, in a conservative vector field, this is achieved by minimizing the action, that is the integral of the Lagrangian, right? And it may be just sort of a like nice, nice uh, or kind of curiosity, but there is actually some very important implication of this. And the, the implication is that, so consequence, of this fact is that um, along each path you know basically satisfying the Newton's law of motion the total energy and I'm going to define what that is, is conserved. The energy (coughs) 
is defined by this H instead of L, and it's given by mx prime squared over 2 plus u of x. So again, take any path, right? Between two points, say. You can, you can compute this. It's going to be a function of time along that path, right? Well, what this statement is saying is that along the optimal path, this quantity is independent of t. It's, it's constant. And if you think of this as kinetic energy and as a potential energy, it says that the sum of the two stays constant. Okay? So the first time you see this, and you know, I mean, that's kind of a principle that everybody says: if there is no friction, there is no energy loss, right? But um, if you think about how to how to prove such a thing, is um, well, could be a little bit daunting. I mean, not that it can be done, but you can do it. But uh, what I want to show you is actually how this actually follows from this um, uh, Lagrangian, or how from, from this principle of least action. Okay. So <clears throat> here's a fact, general fact about order Lagrange equations for a general functional. where L is basically a function of two variables only. Not a two or two n, depending on but there's no initial there's no T dependence in this case. Okay? What can you do? What can you do about this? Well, let's just uh, rewrite the order Lagrange equations. This is L x. You know, x i or x. Just just think about. Uh, I'm just going to write like this, but. So I want to I want to actually evaluate this at x of t and x prime of t minus d by dt l x prime x of t x prime of t. Okay. If that's the case, x is either vector or scalar. It doesn't doesn't matter here. This is equivalent to the following. Basically, you can write this as a derivative of some some quantity. And the quantity is the following is L <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, yeah. It's just L at x and x prime minus x prime of t l x prime at x and x prime. Okay, so let's see why is this equivalent. Well, it's simply as taking the derivative with respect to t inside, right? So if you take the derivative of, uh, of L, what do you get? You get L sub x 
times x prime, right? I'm going to suppress the arguments for L. Plus L sub x prime, x double prime. That's product. I mean, sorry, that's the chain rule in the first one. You take the derivative of the first one here. So it's going to be the partial of L with respect to the first variable, L sub x, times the derivative of, of, of x with respect to t, right? Plus partial of L with respect to second variable, x prime, times x, the derivative of x prime, x double prime, right? And now let's do this as a product rule, right? So I'm going to take the partial of this, so it's going to be x double prime, I'm sorry, not just the partial, the derivative of x prime, so minus x double prime, L x prime, minus x prime, the derivative with respect to t of L x, you know, with the, with the argument. What do you see here? This and this cancel. And what, what's left is, is x prime times Lx minus derivative with respect to t of Lx prime. Okay? And this is zero. Okay? So again, how do you get from Euler Lagrange equation to this? It's simply multiplying both sides by x prime of t, and then you know adding and subtracting this term, and then recombining the derivative to look like that. Okay. As a consequence, the Euler-Lagrange equation in this particular situation can be written as just this expression is constant in t, independent of t. Okay. So if L is just a function of two variables and not three variables. In other words, there's no T explicit dependence. Then order Lagrange equation can be written as L of x of t x prime of t minus x prime of t l x l sub x prime x of t x prime of t equals constant because the derivative is zero with respect so that's a constant right well if you go back and and uh, plug in this in the uh, Hamilton in the Lagrangian. So, if L of x and x prime as m x prime squared over two minus u of t of x, then. h of x, well, then the Euler Lagrange equations for this look the following way. So just L, so m x prime squared over 2 minus u of t, or u of x, minus, so this is just L, right? Minus x prime times the partial of L with respect to the second variable that we computed. It's mx prime, right? And basically we know this is a constant independent of t. Well, just look at the first and the last term. This gives you, this is one half minus, basically one, it's basically minus one half mx prime squared minus u of x equals c. Okay? So it means that the, what we call h 
we just call it with plus is constant independent of t okay so that says the energy the total energy of the kinetic energy plus potential energy is conserved That's one, that's one property that's kind of important and follows from this um, <coughs> Lagrangian formulation. So basically, thinking of the mass times acceleration equal force as being the Euler Lagrange equation for um, a minimization problem. Let's talk about, um, so just for, for your reference, I mean this part of this is, is, uh, is, uh, is described here at page 152, but the notation is, I mean they use T instead of X, so that's what physicists would use. Um, they use U instead of our X, okay. so they keep U as, as the path, and U prime would be the Velocity. Okay. But uh, uh, notice that the notation is can be. I mean, are we talking about one one dimensional or are we talking about n dimensional? You know, you can keep the same notation and just interpret. Um, like here, the length. I mean, the norm. The bars represent in n dimension would represent the length of that vector. Okay, so <clears throat> let me talk about the uh, one very famous uh, variational problem, the brachisto cron problem. One forty five. So we're gonna we're kind of going a little bit back and forth, but um, this chapter is so huge that we're we're not gonna be able to cover the whole thing. Um, <clears throat> so the the Brachistochron problem uh, and the etymology is from Brachistos, which says the least, and Chronos. Is the time. So basically, the problem is the following. It says that in the gravitational field, constant gravitational field, so we're not talking about extraterrestrial, just like at the surface of the Earth, say, um, where the gravitational field is constant. You have two points, you know, they could even be at the same uh, height, but you have two points and you'd like to um, kind of let one particle go from point A to point B, and you want to know what's the least amount of time that it takes, okay? Um, and you might even kind of uh, visually guess that you have to take some sort of a route uh, that's not a straight line. May not be a straight, and it's not going to be a straight line. Certainly, the the paths that you know a path like this would take longer because. Uh, well, we'll see. We'll see why it takes longer. But you can kind of sense that um, it might be very slow here, so you may spend a lot of time 
uh, before going down to B on this along this path. And what is actually you know what determines that time? It's basically the velocity. I mean, what's the velocity um, of, of such a particle along a path? Well, here's where we're going to use this uh, total energy being conserved. So we're going to say that, so let's call V to be the velocity. So this is an R2. We're talking about R2 because, I mean, R3 is the same. doesn't matter. You take two points, you can find a plane, vertical plane, uh, in which to, to have the motion. Um, so let's talk about, excuse me, the derivative of the position as being the speed, if you want, right? So this is the speed at a given time. Then what do we know from the total energy conserved? The, this um, sum of the kinetic and potential energy is constant. And we actually know what the um, potential is, is mgh, right? Where h is the height. So let's call it. Um, vertical axis h, for instance, right? So there's a second component of x. There's a horizontal component, there's a vertical component. So the vector x is, I don't know, displacement and height, okay? So what is that, what is that thing saying? It's saying that if initially you have some speed, Right? But actually, think about it in the following way. Think about it. Initially, you have zero speed and certain height, right? Then you're going to gain speed if you decrease the height, right? But if you, for instance, try to go along the other path, that is, go back to a similar height, then you're going to get zero speed again, right? So the idea is that you want to decrease your height fast enough, right, so that you increase the speed fast enough so that the, the tr you travel less. The problem is, you know, the length, if you decrease the height too fast, right, you're going to go um, a longer distance, right? So, so we saw last time, we saw the shortest distance is along the straight line. But if you go along the straight line, you may actually, I mean, you're not increasing your f speed fast enough, right? So clearly that, that there is some somewhere in between like an optimal uh, path along which the time it takes, so I guess I, shouldn't, I, didn't take, I didn't say what the optimization problem is, is find the path um, between two points A and B um, along which um, a particle travels the least amount of time in the uh, gravitational field with no friction. So we're talking about an ideal situation which uh, there, in which there is no friction, so there is no, there's no other force. This is the only force <coughs> 
uh, that acts on the object, right? Okay, so uh, so think about h, even h equals zero, and you start with velocity equal to zero, zero at a. So without loss of generality. We're going to assume that the height at point A and velocity are both zero. Okay? Then we have that mv squared over 2 plus mgh equals zero. So that gives you sort of a formula for the velocity. Uh, not for the velocity, for the speed. Okay, so this is the this is the length of the velocity. It's not the actual velocity vector. It's just the, the length of the velocity. Okay, <clears throat> to be given by the, by this formula. So again, here the height would be sort of the uh, starting at zero and going negative, right? So you have the velocity, uh, the, the square root of that quantity, and that's that's uh, well defined. Okay. So, how do we set up this as being an a optimization problem? Well, we'd like to express the time traveled from A to B along a path, let's say x is x of t. Okay, so this this time is going to be computed the following way. It's going to be taken to be sort of infinitesimal. You you add the times it takes let's think about it like this. If this is the arc length, so the the arc length is sort of the infinitesimal length on that path, right? And you have velocity or speed, you know, that's the speed, the length of the velocity equals v, right? Then the time it takes is the distance divided by the speed, right? If that speed was constant, right? But because it's not constant, you know, you're going to have to integrate along the curve, right? Let's call it curve C. So that's pretty much a line integral with respect to the arc length. That's again, ds is the arc length. You must have seen this in calculus 3, but you probably forgot how it's done. Um, well, how it's done is basically ds is replaced by the length of Um, the position, so this is the square root of uh, x1 squared, x1 prime squared plus x2 prime squared. Okay? And for v, Computed from from above, what v should be? V should be, and v is the square root of two uh, g x two. 
I think. Okay? X2 is the height, right? Uh, X2 goes, say, up um, vertical. Well, think about X2 going uh, horizontal, I mean, uh, upside down from the height. So that's the system in which you actually describe that that uh, motion. So it starts at, at A and it goes down. So you don't have the minus there. Right? So this is the point A and this is the point B here. Okay? All right. And now finally, the, the next, uh, the other thing to say is that uh, one can pick one can parameterize the curve C such that X1 is just T. So you go, you can always parameterize a curve, well not always, but you can parameterize, um, well you can, you can only consider the curves that can be parameterized by, you know, X1 equals T, and x2 is a function of x1, pretty much. Right? So, anyway, in the end, what you end up with is the following. You want to minimize the integral of this, square root of 1 plus x prime um, let me use u because they use u in the book, so let me use u here. So u prime, they use u or t? Sorry. They use y, okay, so let's, let's use y here. Now they use x, I'm going to use t because it's... Um, hold on a second. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't matter. So it's going to be divided by the square root of, uh, forget a 2g, just y of t dt. And this is from a to b. Has x everywhere? Okay, so but in the variable, I mean, the integration doesn't matter, right? Yeah, it's the, up, the upside down. This should be the upside down. So this is, okay, this is the y of t, and this is the t. Is that? Okay, so the parameterization is the, is the other way around. So you, you parameterize... Yeah, I should use x. X and y of x. Yeah, I don't know. So subject to 
y of a is so that would be uh, I mean that would be the displacement sort of so this is y1 in this case is 0 and y of b is whatever this distance is here so this is uh, and they use b Let me call this little d. So that's the distance traveled along horizontal line. <clears throat> yeah, okay, so I mean, the, the only. Uh, yeah, the thing that. I, we shouldn't have really done is write the, the arc length in terms of t because t would be the time traveled by, by this particle. So it's kind of, um, we should have used a different letter here. And I think using x would have been better, but um, might have you know gotten confused. So let me, let me put like a t prime or a t. prime everywhere so that's okay so this is really along the um, so or uh, renaming t prime equals x so that's the that's the vertical coordinate for the height, you have to minimize the integral over the height, uh, I mean, of the square root of 1 plus y prime of x squared over square root of x dx. I mean, you really start at 0 and you go uh, to some, some number. B, let's say B here, okay? With Y of 0 is 0, Y of B is the horizontal displacement, okay? <clears throat> okay, so what is, what is the uh, functional here? Well, this time the functional only depends on Two variables. One is the independent variable, so it's the so that's the integrand, right? The integrand is the square root of one plus y prime of x squared and square root of x. Right? So what's the Euler Lagrange equations? Uh, there's only one equation, right? So it's basically saying um, f with respect to y, that's zero, right? Because y doesn't appear explicitly. Minus derivative with respect to x of f with respect to y prime, okay? Is zero but partial with respect to y is 0 because f does not depend on the position explicitly, right? It only depends on, well, the position being, it's kind of hard to kind of uh, name y being the position, but it, doesn't, it only depends on the independent variable x and the derivative of y with respect to the independent variable x. And what's f y prime? I think we did this last time. It was y prime divided by the square root of 1 plus y prime squared. And of course, the square root of x stays, you know, as a, as a, as a constant, right? You take the partial derivative, so that's...
Okay, so the oil at Lagrange, say uh, the derivative with respect to x of this expression is zero. Which means that the expression, the partial of f with respect to y prime, is constant, right? So, I mean, moving the square root of x c squared of x uh, to the right side. You know, what's the goal? The goal is to find y prime, right? Remember when we talked about the shortest path, the shortest distance, the shortest length, uh, we didn't have the square root of x here. That's the only difference. Now we have the square root of x. So this guy is You square both sides. C square x. And then you solve for y prime squared. So it's c square x 1 plus y prime squared. So it's linear in y prime squared. C square 1 minus c square x. So y prime is basically the square root of c square x over 1 minus c square x. And y of x by integration is the integral of this. So it's the square root of c square x over 1 minus c square x dx. Remember the derivative is with respect to x, so it's the integral is going to be with respect to x as well. Um, and the limits are zero to well, really, it's the improper integral. It's the, it's, I'm sorry, it's the indefinite integral. Integral. If you want to put improper, in, if you want to put a proper integral, you'd have to. Uh, change y of x is the integral from 0 to x of square root of c square s over 1 minus c square s ds, right? <coughs> so that's the formula you have in the book. The only difference in the book is they use a different constant c. I think they use the reciprocal 1 over c. So you can write this as the integral from 0 to x square root of s over 1 over c squared minus s ds. Okay? But, you know, who's going to determine the value of c? So the value of C is determined by the condition that Y at B is a, a certain value, right? Whatever the, whatever the uh, second point was. The first point we picked it to be in the origin, so the second point is has some um, coordinates. And I guess you could stop here, but it turns out that if you go a little bit farther and try to look for the shape of that curve, because we, we still don't know right what, is, what the shape of the curve is. Of course, if you integrate that explicitly, you would actually um, figure it out. But there is a smart way of actually uh, uh, parameterizing this curve. Instead of thinking of it as a graph of a function, you just find a parameterization. So that's that's basically done the following way. Um, maybe, maybe I'll skip. It's actually this change of variable. Yeah, 
S equals 1 over C, 2C squared, 1 minus cosine of R. So that's 1 over C squared sine square of R over 2. So that would be a trigonometric substitution, <coughs> which what would give you, in the denominator here, would give you cosine squared, right? 1 minus sine squared, cosine squared. In the top, it would be sine squared, sine squared over cosine squared, tangent squared. Theta squared would be just tangent. Right? And then, of course, something by differentiating S. Um, so you get rid of the square root. That's the important thing. You'd also get rid of the fraction. Right? So it would be just a uh, <coughs> change of variable in the integral. And what you get is the following. So you get the... T to be C squared, well, I'm using the 1 over C, so 1 over C squared times 2, T minus sine T, and X of T is 1 over C squared, 1 minus cosine of T. And this is called a cycloid um, curve. And in case you've, you probably might might have seen this in the um, in calculus two. What's the cycloid? I mean, the cycloid is sort of. If you roll a ball, I mean like a, a wheel, where one point on the circumference is marked, so you kind of roll it this direction. And then when it gets to, you know, the marked point is on top, right? From here to there, this is what's, what a cycloid looks like. And it keeps, kind of keeps going like this. It's what you see on a bicycle at night if the bicycle had like a uh, um, bright spot on its on its circumference, which of course it doesn't. It, it has somewhere in between, but halfway or some. Um, in which case, it would be sort of a cycloid, but slightly different. Okay, so that that's the shape, and I don't think there is actually an explicit function that would you could describe this. So the best way to, to represent the cycloid is through this parameterization. And if you invert this and you put it sort of on the vertical plane, you would be exactly this shape here. So a portion of this is how you get from a point A to a point B in least time. So, this is, this is sort of a famous um, variational problem. <clears throat> and it was, of course, solved, I mean, this, I don't know, 16th century, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a long time, 17th century, it's a long time ago. Um, but... It kind of gives you a sense why. I mean, why is that? Why is the shape uh, like that and not um, not 
not like steeper or less steep. Right? Any 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 less steep? You know, if you start less steep, you're gonna spend more time. More steep, you're gonna spend less time, but you're gonna go longer distance. Okay. Um, let me just state one more. So minimal, one more application, minimal surface of revolution. And by that I mean the following. So the following problem to find, so given two um, circles in the vertical plane that are like this. So you have They're kind of a line on a, on a horizontal line, but they're vertical vertical circles. So in, in effect, you have two radii. One is here, and you have another radii. And I think they use x for the horizontal direction. So you have two circles like this with possibly different radii. What you'd like to do is you'd like to find a surface of revolution. So what's a surface of revolution? It's basically um, a path between those two points that is then you know rotated around the x-axis. And it gives you a surface. Of course this would be the symmetric. So Hopefully, I can draw it like symmetric. Okay. So a path uh, like the the full dot, the full red path here would determine uh, the surface of revolution by rotation about the x-axis. So the question is: find a path, find the surface of revolution. Of minimum minimum area. Okay. And it's very quick to kind of um, write that down. The surface area of, of such a the area of such a surface of revolution is given by the integral from a to b. There's a 2 pi uh, u of x. So if u is actually just the displacement from the you know of the of the top um, <coughs> at location x, or, or if you want, is the radius of the cross section at location x times the square root of one plus u prime of x squared. So you want to minimize this under the conditions. So U admissible means U of A is A and U of B is B. Okay. So again, it's it's a variational problem, standard variational problem. Um, So, if you give me two more minutes, then I can write the euler lagrange equations. So, let's see. I have F. I'm going to kind of go back to that uh, lambda and C in Xi. So, this... The integrand is just lambda squared of 1 plus xi squared, right? Lambda stands for u and xi stands for u prime. 
So the order of Lagrange says f lambda minus derivative with respect to x, f c psi equals zero. M? What's f lambda? Lambda is just appears just there, so it's just the square root of one plus psi squared minus derivative with respect to x. What is f psi? Lambda psi over the square root of one plus psi squared. Okay. So of course you have to replace psi with u prime and lambda with u. Okay. Now the <coughs> problem is how can you you know how can you write a, a differential equation for u? If you kind of take this derivative inside, you're going to get u double prime, right? And the, which is nowhere else. And that's you know sometimes okay. Um, I mean there's nothing else to do, but in this case <coughs> we can kind of if we multiply by u prime, we can actually make a perfect derivative, just like in that uh, previous, you know, like earlier today, right? Since f is independent of x, it only depends on the u and u prime, or, or lambda and psi, and this means. What was the um, analog form, the, the, the similar form? It was f minus u prime f, well, u prime was psi, f psi, so u prime psi equals, equals zero. Of course, this was evaluated at u of x, u prime of x, u of x, u prime of x. So, in the end, you can just write what this equivalent form is. So, the thing inside, f, f was lambda, so that's u of x square root of 1 plus u prime of x squared minus u prime of x times the partial of f with respect to the second variable that was u of x u prime of x over the square root of 1 plus u prime of x squared equals a constant so this is a constant thing right? So if you suppress the the, uh, the uh, variable, I mean the, the uh, argument x, it's just going to look like this: u one plus u prime squared under the square root minus u u prime squared over the square root of one plus u prime squared equals constant. Okay. When you simplify this, well. How do you simplify? Just write the common denominator. Look what you get. Well, u times 1 plus u prime squared, right? It's common denominator. Minus u times u prime squared in the numerator over the square root and the denominator is constant. Yes? No, I put it squared. So this and that is the square of u prime. <clears throat> and you can see that that thing cancels, so it's only u over the square root of 1 plus u prime squared equals c. That's a great simplification, right? Because now there's no u double prime. Of course, you have a constant which you, you'll have to find from, initial, from uh, kind of boundary conditions. Right? But if you keep doing this, then you're going to get square root of 1 plus u prime squared equals c over u. No, u over c, excuse me. 1 over c times u. So 
So the 1 plus u prime squared is 1 over c squared u squared. So u prime squared is 1 over c squared u squared minus 1. So u prime is the square root of, plus or minus the square root of u squared minus c squared over c squared. So if you do separation of variables, you're going to get something like this, and after integration. So this is x, 1 over c plus another constant, let's say d. And I'm not going to go through integrating that expression. I mean, there is, um, well, you can do it through uh, various changes of variables, but ends up being cosine hyperbolic inverse of u over c. So in the end, u over c is the cosine hyperbolic of 1 over c plus d. So u of x is c times cosine hyperbolic 1 over cx plus d. This is what ends up looking like. So it's like that. Cosine hyperbolic, remember, it's like an even function. Of course, it's translated. It's not really centered at the origin. It's not symmetric with the vertical axis. It's a little bit... Um, translate it, and that's because you know if you do, if you have two things that are not the same, I mean not um, the same height, you're going to have to have some probably shifted closer here than here, right? With a minimum. So that's part of. The, so if you if you kind of extend this, you would go like a cosine hyperbolic, right? But it's shifted. If the two circles have the same radius, then it would be a symmetric. There would be no d there, right? Okay. And the story is that um, there is actually a dozen. Um, There's no solution for all possible uh, uh, radii and also the distance between the two circles. So, <clears throat> so to find C and D, one needs to use the values of the of U at the two endpoints. Okay. And um, unfortunately, this has this doesn't have solutions always. So here's so um, depending on a, b, and pr pretty much the distance between the two circles. B minus A, uh, this may or may not have solutions. In other words, you may not be able to find such um, constant C and D to satisfy to satisfy these equations. And <clears throat> this this is kind of a nice. I was trying to actually show you a movie, but I, I couldn't actually make it to work. Um, in which you know, depending if it's not as much as the values of a and b as it is the distance between the two circles. So if you have two circles that are fixed, fixed radius, right? But you kind of move them up far apart, then you can see that this cosine hyperbolic is really exploding quite fast. So you may not be able to actually get it to, you know, to fit this cosine hyperbolic, you know, with those particular values at the endpoints. Okay. Um, this particular surface has a very nice property, which is 
I mean, which is the minimum area, right? And that's called minimum uh, minimum surfaces, if you want, with this boundary conditions. And all all this is saying is that if they are too far apart, you may not be getting um, a bona fide surface that has minimum area. The minimum area is going to achieved if you have. So if they're far apart enough, then you would have the following. You'd have. The minimum area is going to achieved by just like a vertical um, it would be sur the surface of this circle plus the surface of this circle okay and that has to do with this um, you know I'll, I'll tell you after the break I mean but it's think about a soap film um, that wants to be kind of stick to this you know two circles, two circumferences. If they're close enough, you can actually make a soap film to kind of, you know, go from one to the other. Whereas if they're far apart, the soap film is going to kind of detach I and mean, it's going to break and you're going to get actually the, um, <clears throat> you're going to fill this, this circle and that circle and that's it. And so sometimes you don't have, I mean, you have a minimization problem, but it's not sort of the one you're looking for as far as the admissible paths. Okay, so let's take a break. I don't know.